So in order to keep going with this panel, there's life beyond extractivism, plundering and mercantilization of protests. We are going to present our speakers, a Marxist historian, also Joao Ambrosi from Curitiba, Brazil, and Jessica from Rede Socialista in DMST, Argentina. So, Renan, human rights activist from Colombia, you can go ahead. Um, how much time do I have? Around 15, 18 minutes. Okay, hello everyone, good afternoon. Comrades from the world, I'm really grateful to be here sharing this moment with you. So as I don't have that much time, I will start right now. Last few years, we have talked a lot about, about extractivism and extractivism is only talked about when talking about um, the extraction of the energetic resources or natural resources, but we could say it's a general characteristic of capitalism. Diverse um, elements, for example, extractivism in education, how universities have become, uh, let's say, a hunting ground for extractivism, for cheap labor. And that's how all uh, our countries and underdeveloped countries are prepared. Also in sports, when we have uh, small children um, sold as players, there is also urban extractivism with um, urbanization at the service of the capital. So I think that we should have a wide understanding of extractivism and not reducing it only to resources, to natural resources or energetic resources. But this is the more, most evident one. Um, it's the most um, visible one. It's um, destruction is easier to see in that way and also impossible to, to go back after it's done. So we could say that today Extractivism is a characteristic of global capitalism. Not only in our countries, but we can see it in Europe, in Germany. Until December last year, or until January of this year, it was shown as a promoter of uh, green energies, friendly, environmentally friendly energies. And now it has fallen upon um, energetic de dependence, part of its, its, its structure. And now it is going back to the most um, polluting um, kinds of fuels. So it works with that logic. And the rest of the world uh, provides the materials and those countries do um, waste their energy, energy and resources. Here in Colombia, this extractivist model has been reinforced generally uh, during the last uh, 20 years especially with uh, mining, last 15 years. Uh, the Juan Manuel Santos regime between 2010 and 2018 sold Colombia as a mining country and was dedicated to uh, track 
every area and any region uh, that can be sold to transnational capitals. Not only the most uh, known and usual materials like oil and copper, but also unusual uh, materials, like building materials. Like, for example, limestones. So, this has uh, resulted in the proscription of Colombian territories and has also resulted in resistance. And this extractivist model is also um, comes hand in hand with contingency. Um, and this has taken place for many years, more than 70 years with this internal conflict. So extractivism has been in hand in hand with counting certain um, elements. So they create an internal enemy to create calmness between internal and ex external uh, investment. And that enemy is the enemy of this model and the enemy of the farmers. The enemies are the farmers, for example, that has to be taken out from the land for companies to pave their way, uh, students, workers, professors, indigenous sectors, so that internal enemy idea has been spread and this counterinsurgent model comes hand in hand with extractivism to impose itself in our country. After the 1991 constitution was approved. So that extractivism has presented itself in the most diverse places. I would like to make uh, to show you two or three examples. This, this urban extractivism, like in Medellin, um, probably people who are listening to us have seen that Medellin has been um, talked about like a symbol, like an emblem of how Colombia should be. And that now has abandoned this idea to be of being dominated by cartels and drug trafficking. But 30 years ago, Medellin was the second industrial um, sector of the whole country. That was 30 years ago, not anymore. So there was a violent process that has resulted in the death of hundreds of Medellin inhabitants. And there was also another violent um, event that occurred that was called um, Orion Operation with um, implied prosecuting all social sectors which had any kind of organization or demands, but also uh, murdering leaders. Anyone who could pose a threat for international capital. This was a long process and has there is a symbol of this um, event, which is a mass grave um, in which the bodies of hundreds of Colombian inhabitants were located. And this was carried out by the governments and military forces and also financed by different companies. And they did track all the people that they believed were a threat. So they want to um, erase that past 
and pose as a modern city, but they are an extractivist um, city. It's the capital of aesthetic surgeries. For example, tourism, and you have, uh, there are packages, tourism packages, which include also uh, aesthetic surgery or plastic surgery. There are people who die in those um, operation rooms, but there are also other cases. For, for example, in Antioca, they are, uh, they build huge um, dams for hydroelectric um, plants so that they can sell the energy to all uh, company and mining projects. One of the of these dams is like a white elephant, a, a huge and malfunctioning uh, dam that was built and the dangers of its design um, was also denounced. And every people who were critic of this construction were also uh, taken out of the way, either threatened or imprisoned. And in those cases, uh, there were people involved who now are part of political power. So the bodies of the people who were murdered because of the because they opposed to this dam will also be buried in this um, during the construction of uh, the building of the dam. So when they uh, failed in their project, there were people who protested and organized against it, and the um, armed forces also had to. Uh, repress those actions. In Antioquia, this year, they will carry out uh, another project, which is a gold mine. The biggest gold, uh, mine, uh, a surface mining in the whole country. So uh, the massacres, uh, disappearances, this has taken place in the last 25 years. And this model of counterinsurgency and extractivism is linked to uh, national and international capital, to which uh, Colombian resources and territories are essential. So they um, need to implement uh, the armed forces at their service. So Colombia is an example of this fusion, but that does not mean that in the middle of uh, all of these uh, heinous acts, uh, that does not mean that there are no alternative projects or organized resistances. The great uh, social sectors, indigenous sectors, farming sectors, Afro-descendant inhabitants also from other regions of our country and other national resistances and a great extraordinary movement, an anti-extractivist movement in essence, even if they have not expressed it. It was the general uh, national strike that took place and why do I say this? It is because uh, in small, medium, and sized uh, cities uh, have to face the consequences of this extractivist model because metals are also extracted in those cities, but because cities have been um, turned into an essential element of transnational capitalism. So in order to, now that I'm reaching the end, so in spite of massacres, in spite of violence, of course that there is life after or beyond um, extractivism. There is resistance, there is opposition, and they um, 
a stand with an alternative and another alternative model. So um, thank you, Renan. So that we can continue, we will now ask Joao Ambrosi. Joao, are you there? From Curitiba, Brazil. We can start talking about the worsening of the Estamos vivenciando problemas ambientais uh, em larga escala. Todo indica que o futuro, se mantenemos este sistema, é desastroso e sem perspectivas de mejora. Alguns países tentam tomar medidas. Limitando essas medidas para que não entre em contradição com as políticas que favorecem o mercado financeiro. Tentam trazer problemas. They try to introduce green capitalism in the debate, seeking solutions that are inefficient to, no, to avoid damaging the economic system sustain, by, sustained by the environmental damage. Brazil is a country of agribusiness, agriculture, and livestock. We are the second exporter of soil and the third of corn. We are also the biggest exporters of meat and chicken in the world. Agribusiness is 27% of the GDP per sale, which practically turns it into the engine of our economy. Trying to contribute a new vision to produce in an ecological way is clashing with the owners of powers. Farmers keep the life of the economy in Brazil alive. We have become hostages of the system of monoculture, exploitation, and boosting of unemployment. Agribusiness demands great extensions of lands to produce only monocultures, mainly soy and corn. The solution originates in the problem, that is to say, generating resources that need impact. The institutions are ruled by the exploiters. They sell us and the world the false truth that agriculture feeds 800 million people in Brazil and in the entire world, which is a lie. Our food serves to feed the pigs in China and the animals in Brazil. Basically, it becomes food for the animals. This number of 800 million doesn't have into account the total, and it is not the production that turns into food for human beings who, who consume daily soy and corn as food. This production has a great impact in the environment as it needs a lot of land to produce Nós servimos apenas como celeiro e o fim é exported to developed countries. Na Europa e ao redor do mundo, we serve to feed the world. In Europe, where there are no farming lands, they are benefited by this neocolonial system. Today, more than 97% of the surface I was that was cut down in Brazil is in hands of the agro industry. The lands become great fields for the production of monoculture. The deforestation, it is the lack of nutrients in the soil due to the production of cereals 
as with meat, causing a lot of damage in the surrounding ecosystems. They still use agrotoxics, usually thrown from planes due to the grand extension of the land. These agrotoxics affect the animals and the flora in the production of food and the life of the working class. Pesticides are also used in the production of meat that is consumed. And since animals for slaughter end up eating a lot of these foods that is poisoned. Brazilian agriculture uses 70% of water, which turns the farmer in a monopolist of the most valuable good for humanity to produce one kilo of meat. 15,000 liters of water are used and 1,800 liters per kilogram for soy. To produce one kilo of apples, we use 350 liters and 1,000 liters per kilogram for other crops. In 2020, it was the greater, the greater producer of greenhouse gases in Brazil, generating methane gas, which is even more damaging in the CO2. And the media believe that it is only fossil fuels, which are the villains of the impact in the ozone layer. All this information show us that we need to revolutionize the agricultural production in Brazil and in the world. We also need to rethink production of meat in a big scale. We need to decentralize the production of food by starting with more agriculture in lands that are smaller, that respect the regional biodiversity. There is no clean production within the capitalist system. Capitalism is a culprit of the crisis of the climate that we are seeing. The agri-industry that is speculative has its origin in the way of the capitalist production that produces a lot and at the same time causes starving. We are the working class, we are the socialists. We also have to take the means of production. Since food is the base of any society that things to be developed. There is no revolution that is feasible without taking the means of production of food. We need a system that produces food for those who need it. They need to produce respecting the soil, the fauna and the flora, a model that seeks a balance in the environment that produces food to provide for the cities close to where they are to generate food sovereignty that nurtures and helps the development of society. Food are not commodities. Hunger cannot be a benefit. Feeding food, quality food should be a right and for this, any citizen in any country. Only a production that is eco-socialist can provide with a demand that is so huge. We must remove the speculation off the plate of the civilizations in the entire world. Eco-socialism is an alternative, a radical alternative for the civilization founded in basic arguments of the ecologist movement and the Marxist critique of the political economy. It opposes the destructive pro progress of capitalism that is taking the world to an ecological catastrophe uh, and a pol policy founded on non-trading non criteria, the, needs of the social needs and ecological balance. Eco-socialism is at the same time a political strategy that is anti-capitalist that seeks a convergence of the social and ecological struggles. We need, to, we need to make food accessible for everyone 
so everyone can be healthy for those who produce and above all for the environment that generates a production that respects the ecological balance with food 100% ecological. It is feasible. We need to make this reality. We need to throw away the system that doesn't allow us to have a way of production. We seek a production that provides the ecological principles that take care and treat ecosystems, both productive as the ones that are for the preservation of natural resources, that are culturally sensitive, socially fair, and economically feasible, providing then a sustainable agroecosystem. In this way, we are taking an agrarian reform and we will change the way of production generating less impacts and we will make uh, a countryside that is prosperous for freeing the people. Capitalism is uh, an environment, don't go hand in hand. So I want to give a great embrace to everyone who fight to keep biomes in Brazil alive. So to close this, this panel, we're asking Jessica Gentile from the Eco-Socialist Network in Argentina, if you can say a few words. How are you doing? Well, it is very timely to make this eco-socialist meeting in the, in the face of the crisis. I was listening in the previous panels and it is amazing. We have so much in common and we're sharing the same problems and the same enemies. So I hope this forum helps to share the solutions and a path of struggle. In the morning, the Pakistan declarations were amazing in the face of the humanitarian crisis they are suffering. And we're moved by what Pakistan is going through. And it is a reflex of what's going on in all the countries and all the peoples. Collapse is something that is real and we are reaching it with terrible consequences. Our generation is threatened not only by the crisis of the environment, the, the most important one in history, also by the pandemic and the wars and famines that hit different peoples in the, in the planet, the destruction of ecosystems. But I think that one of the biggest threats of our generation is falling in the false ideologies and discourses of the system proposing that we cannot change the system. The environmental crisis does not exist, that it is an invention of socialists or wars, trying to convince us that the only way out in the face of the crisis is within this system. It is one of the biggest lies and the most dangerous one. The environmental crisis we are living today coincides, not casually, with the system, with the levels, the logics of overproduction of hyperconsumerism that is not planned based on private property and accumulation by a very few and by exploiting the social majorities. That is why it is a, a cultural battle and a political battle that is huge. Capitalism is just an episode in the history and we had to fight to defend our life, our health, our common resources, our planet. In a point, we were fighting so long against extractivism, we feel, it feels like a self-fulfilled prophecy. It, it accumulates the number of papers and investigations so scientists around the world and the IPCC, they, they state that if we don't reduce greenhouse gases in the next period, life in the planet as we know it is in danger. And also our civilization, our continent, Latin America, does not escape from this reality. The continent is affected by this collapse, the environmental crisis. 
And as they said before, Rainer from Colombia, constructivism has many dangers. I want to tell you about what's going on in our country in Argentina with constructivism in the last two or three years. There's been advance by the official list. First of all, they allowed in the coast of the Atlantic, the offshore industries were allowed to install the rigs. We've seen the disasters around the world, in Mexico, in Peru, in South Africa, the spills, they were terrible, destroying the flora, the fauna. But it, it is not enough. Yesterday, in the Patagonia, in Rio Negro, the entire political power modified a, a law, the 3008, that protects the San Matias Coast, but it was the only one protected from the oil industries so that they can move forward over the San Matias Gulf. And in the Patagonia, in Neuquén, in the area of Acamorta, they green light so that they can apply fracking where seismic seismic events are, are very common. There's no scientist in the world that the oil and this these methods are generating a, an imbalance and it's taking us to the collapse of humanity. This government, the Argentina government, that is national and popular, it is the one that is allowing through its green speeches for the youth, for the environment, it's moving forward. And a few kilometers away from the coast, what I was talking about, the offshore, They installed a new power plant by the Chinese government. And as they move forward with military bases in Neuquén, in our territory, violating our sovereignty, granting them to the, the US, the Argentinian government, make businesses with anybody, with the US, with China, in the Northeast, in the northwest of our country, there is a lithium reservoirs. We are resisting already because it is not enough for them to talk about progress and development, the false discourses that they have used since the 90s to, to boost these activities, saying that it will, we will produce work and development. There's been major resistance against those lies. Now to talk about energy transition. They move forward with lithium and with green hydrogen, and they want to extract more oil, more gas. As Renan said, it is not only about oil and mining. We only, we also have very great problems in the cities, the heat waves, the confiscation of green spaces, building great uh, constructions only for the capitalists while the populations don't have, don't have houses. The, they need to stop doing businesses in the cities because we have the collapse with the contamination of air and the rivers and the lack of green spaces. I want to stop by in a problem we are living in our country for a few months about the Northeast. I'm going to talk about, I'm going to talk about, to, to talk slower. We are talking about the Ibera, the wetlands. They are the second largest wetland in the world. Corporation, agribusinesses, 
I'm going to stress. They have removed all the fauna flora in, in favor of the agroindustry. It was not enough. In the beginning of the year, they started again. And because they got, we got used to it, the burnings, the fires in the wetlands, which are vital. They are the ones that um, filtrate the air that it is essential for human beings. Thousands of acres have burned, and these corporations that are only after profits, it combines with a great drought and with a, with a lower level in the river, in the Paraná, which is our main waterway that was just given away to the great corporations in the service of the businesses of a very few. And it is a new news again in the heart of Cordoba. They try to we're having fires again. While everything burns and our territories burn for a very few, they block the law for access of land for the workers and the communities. And they block the necessary wetlands law, which is fundamental to protect these ecosystems that are our allies, allies to face the crisis. The political power, there's no distinction between false progressivism, the rights of our rights, we say even if they dress as green, they're extractivists because they block essential laws that are important for our ecosystems and they block it. They're very quick to move forward with, uh, with soy and cereals as with a new law of the agribusiness that proposes to, to implement the soy production in the country and to expand the agricultural land. And that means more fires and more destruction of our environment. Sadly, Argentina today is at the, one of the top countries that fumigates with glyphosate that has been proven to be polluting and cause diseases and many problems of health. It is a favorite poison of those who rule and the corporations. But also, we are among the top of the, of the countries that have the first city the most. It is a situation that from west to east, from north to south, there has been an advance to the service of getting dollars to pay the IMF and the other international institutions to ensure the profits of a very few, the owners of everything, and increasingly more private property, and there's been advance in the territory. They don't care about violating laws or repressing. And also like they live in Colombia, the repression and political prisoners. And while they burn our territories, there is not a single person detained. And those who protect the territories in Catamarca and Chubut in Cordoba, all the force of the law is applied. And we see the double standard of this state that it is classist, capitalist, and applies all its force and violence against those who are most vulnerable. But they don't face the corporations and they don't face the capital. That's why 
we think that all these activities that want to apply simultaneously in our country and many parts of the world should be banned. But they have the doors open. And then we have In Argentina, we have a new Monsanto called Proceres. Doesn't have nothing of national. It, have, it has international shareholders. And with the public university, where the main scientists of the country study, they are allied with the university to develop new disaster called the HB4 GMO, which is the new transgenic that's going to be cultivated and used with glyphosate. It is like an experiment by the main corporations at the service of having our vegetables contaminated. That is why we have to denounce the influence of this octopus in our public institutions to stop modifying our curriculum. so that they only use them to, for the benefit of a very few. We need, to, we need to get them out of public universities and education. And education has to be at the service of the public majorities. The problem we are living today is, is a mere political problem. When we discuss productive models, we discuss a political model. When we say that 50% of the population is under the poverty line and unemployment has risen, job precariousness has increased. It is linked to this model that is based on the extraction of our common resources as a service of speculation. And far from industrializing the country to generate more jobs and recovering our industry to generate more jobs and housing. Apart from that, it keeps us as a semi-colonial country that produces raw materials to produce in the international work division. And in economic and ecological terms, there is a huge difference. We need to debate this with other environmental organizations that only think about the environment, but they don't think about the poverty and economic issues that the political crisis has caused. We are very proud because this year we turn 10 years of the Roca Socialista. We were born in the uprising of the of the struggle in Madrid, Argentina, in Cordoba, with the installation of Monsanto, the father of agrotoxics in the world. We, we succeeded in getting them out of the country. It is fundamental the, the development of experimentation because we have been a vanguard in the theoretical development and fighting this extractivism while the rest of the left underestimated the environmental issues and didn't get involved in the main struggles against the polluting corporations. Uh, and in the last period, due to the, the greatness of this discourse, they have started some currents of the left to create their own environmental organizations. We think that it is a good thing to keep on coordinating the struggle diversely and in a unitary way to develop a program 
to get out of the crisis, to give some, some key factors of what to do. I think that first we need, as eco-socialists, we want a different productive matrix by banning mega mining. It is categorical for the prohibition of fracking and agribusiness and urban cementation. And any activity that laundry and pollutes need to be banned. There is a sector of the left linked to other sectors of the officialists that want to regulate these activities activities that have collapsed our ecosystems. In this sense, we are categorical. Science under the logic of capitalism is not neutral. The system develops techniques that destroy our life independently from what class, um, from what class leads. The poor, the working class, whoever is in charge of those activities those activities that developed by capitalism that pollute. And when the, if they don't solve any social necessity, it is necessary to ban them. For us, we need to give a debate in regard to democracy. Communities have to be the ones who have the right of access to information for a collective debate and also the workers need to want to be need to be the one who decide what to do need to be a complete democracy so we can move to another model that is based like the Brazilian said that our access to food is questioned because our territories are fumigated uh, by monoculture and poison for the production of commodities they, for feeding pigs, but not to produce food to feed people. The system cannot ensure in this century something so basic as the right to food. We need to move towards a project and a program that has to be extensive comprehensive without agrotoxics, where food sovereignty has to be a principle, it has to be our right, and agriculture has to be a flag to move forward. It is proven that agroecology does not pollute, but also it has to feed in a big scale and generate job opportunities. For all this, it is fundamental to change and modify the circuit of commercialization, where you produce in one province, you the packaging is done in thousands of miles away, and there are a lot of people in between. We need to fight and discuss geopolitically how we move to our agroecology and proximity agriculture for cities. So food goes from the countryside to the plate directly. So it has to be healthy and many other things. Everything we are discussing is impossible if we don't touch private property, if we don't move toward another regime of social property. That's why the agrarian reform is necessary to remove the parasites who take hold of our common resources. That is in a very few hands and in foreign hands. And how to produce, what to produce, in the service of what? They don't care about the health of the populations and our ecosystem. That's why we have to face these corporations and the multinationals that, have, that own our, our land, 
our ports, our foreign trade and our waterways to Paraná. It is impossible to live together like some, some activists want to make us believe. Activists of green capitalism and the national government, they want to make us to, to believe that we can live with agriculture and agribusiness because the private always wins over the public. It has to be banned so we can move to towards agriculture without transgenics, transgenics and agriculture. We need to move towards renewable energies with a productive recuperation and also job recuperation. The workers as a whole need to be reconverted so no one is left out. And in that framework, the planification, like our Congress said, is very important. How we debate a planification that is democratic of the economy. What the workers decide, the communities decide, what to produce, how to produce. So not a very few profit from it. And what are the needs of society and allocate all those resources and energy to solve those necessities and not for the profit of the capitalists. We have the conviction that there is no possibility of way out that is individual. The best decision individually that we can take activists and those who are seen for the first time and in this forum, the best option is collective organization and to build revolutionary eco-socialist organizations that are also internationalists that have a struggle plan that the state is not neutral, it is classist. This class, this state does everything against us. We have to remove the political class. It decides against the social majorities. For a new society supported by the heroic defensive defense for the environment against those who implement austerity measures. The youth in the world have to stay in the revolutionary struggle. We have the same struggle. We have to make that plan together for insurrection, for a right of a good life. No wars among the peoples nor peace among the classes. Thank you, Jesse Gentile. Before going to the questions, we grouped the questions. Um, we already published the agenda for tomorrow on the website of the ISL. There's a the schedule uh, for each country, each time zone. The panels will be repeated as done today. We are going to explain and inform you again. No, de, no del mundo. Claro, claro. They only publish the schedule of Argentina and Brazil. We put the names of the panelists and the, the time for each country is on the website. Going to the questions, first, there are several. I'm here. There are several about Petro. One says 
if the new government is going to have a policy that is anti-extractivist or not, what is the condition for that? They also ask if about the, the trust vote by a great part of the peasant sector. How do you see the perspective of the solution with the government by the peasant sector? And if you can go deeper on the educational extractivism and health extractivism, and also they ask if you talk about the conditions of the resistance against the extractivism. Those are the questions for Renan. We start with you and then we'll go ahead. How long do I have? It can be 10, 15 minutes. Then we'll do a final round, a final... I imagine that there are many questions and the doubts about the new government of Petro for a basic reason that is during the electoral campaign, Petro presented as a, an environmental candidate in a series of proposals for clean energy, banning fracking, and restricting the functioning of big mining companies to protect the Amazon jungle. Those are the proposals made, but since the beginning, there were many doubts in regards to the same proposals that the question we all have is, those who have an anti-capitalist perspective is, if it is possible to, to do it within capitalism in an isolated manner, because it surpasses the national borders. It is a common policy, but in this territory, we cannot expect a lot from Petro because he's, Petro is not an anti-capitalist politician. His, his ideal is to build a capitalism with a human, ba human face like the Swedish, and in his speeches and the closing of the campaign, when he won the presidency, he said that he was not going to destroy capitalism. He, so people thought that it was only an electoral announcement to keep people quiet and the markets quiet, but he, deep inside, Petro has always been like that. And the forces of the M19 were known from the forces were anti capitalist, even though they have a, an anti democratic struggle. It's been a month with this government. He's just trying, but he's not moving forward. Even though uh, a work minister, minister was appointed, that caused a lot of controversy to affect. In real terms, there has been no measure that you can say it is clear that there is a policy to another direction. So we are still waiting. It is concerning that some of the ministries are the hands of technocrats, 
Secretary General de la CEPAL, Secretary General of the CEPAL, he didn't do anything. He was a counselor of traditional economists of the Daviria administration. So that is a counterweight to start doubting that these policies will be implemented. These policies are conditioned by the economic resources, like a tax reform, but a tax reform that seems to be seems to be very mild. There's a, there are a number of 18,000 pesos. The tax reform is going to be passed to the Congress and 95 million pesos. And it's going to go against the popular sectors. From after reality, there is a huge step. And as a project, it inherits cumulative problems are very hard. The accumulation of land, it is one of the most unfair countries in the world in accumulation of wealth and land. We have a gene rate of 87, one of the highest in the world. And that accumulation of land in the last few years, instead of lowering, it became higher. For the taking over of thousands of hectares by other countries or other cities in Colombia, in the last 25 years, there is a terrible accumulation of land and the peace agreements by the governments left a lot of regions that were left unoccupied by the FARC and they were occupied by the corporations that were interested in destroying the jungle for livestock and promote projects to look for minerals and there's been a massive destruction of the forests and rainforests in Colombia. That's another aspect. And also the previous regime of Ivan Duque that passed many projects. There needs to be a negotiation project with Petro. There, we need measures like expropriation, nationalization. Petro said that they were going to nationalize. They were going to negotiate with the owners in that context in a very legal framework. There can be huge transformations in the environmental area. We don't only have an opposition that is, it is an armed opposition. And have killed people during Petro's government. We were getting into a time of peace, but massacres have continued. And many of the people that have died are indigenous and peasants, activists. Today, we have the shameful record of being the first country in the world above Brazil and Honduras and the Philippines to be the first country. We go in the third year where we are the, the country with the most assassinated environmental activists, which are usually peasants and indigenous people. The multinational corporations are behind this. 
That's what I wanted to say in that field. Mainly, I wouldn't expect much in the government of Petro. One thing is the announcement, and the other is the force that will, if you don't want to mobilize the popular sectors, and you want to do some fixes on the surface, you won't change much. Another thing is, when we talk about extractivism, it goes beyond minerals and electricity. We have a division of labor that is old. What's left for our, our countries by the block that dominates. We have been, we were considered good to produce all kinds of raw materials and energy resources. And the opening of our countries to foreign investment. That is the so called those investment treaties open our country to multinationals of the world, educational multinationals. And so we structure an acad academic world that is not to serve the nation of Colombia or the great Latin American nation, but it serves transnational capital the privatization of universities, academic capitalism serves transnational capital and the links it has with some sectors. And we can see that in the logic, different policies, the way investigation groups work, Everything is tied to the extractivist logist to serve the interest. It doesn't, it doesn't serve the interest of the inhabitants of a country or a continent. Like Latin America, it serves private interests and it structures the invitation experience. The goods that a university can offer become a business a business that trades knowledge, which has become a commodity. We see that in academic tourism. It is a extractivist work and causes pollution because they, it go, they go by plane and it pollutes a lot. One of the very few good things that had a pandemic is the paralyzation of academic tourism. Those unnecessary travels stopped that, that are part of the extractivist university. My stance is not very popular, but that is the reality of the university in Colombia, where I work. In regards to health and extractivism, is a privatization of public goods, hospitals, and turning health in a business where corporations intervene. They're in charge of selling all types of products, commodities, not only pharmaceutical goods, medicines, vaccines, we're turning that into a business that only a part of society can have access to. How long you live is the logic of the system. I think it's a structural system because it is not made for the poorest sectors of the country. It is made for profit by corporations that are national and international. People die in the outskirts in Colombia 
sencillamente porque no tienen cómo pagar o cómo vincularse. They don't have a way to pay the services. Many diseases have reappeared. The pandemic was a disaster because many systems in the country were not up to par because health didn't matter. Those who, those who could pay expensive vaccines until the countries, the states, bought the vaccines. That's what we talk about when extractivism is a mentality. It is an extractivist mentality. The man of the smartphone, the man who uses the smartphone every time, every day, is extractivist. The policy of the smartphone, how many minerals do you need to produce the smartphone? How much energy the energy went from 8% to 13%? And estimations state that if growth goes from 7% a year of new smartphones here from 2030, smartphone will use 100% of the energy of the world. There are individualities that enable the use of extractivism. Extractivism is reduced without acknowledging. Extractivism does not only have to do with the extraction of minerals. The last question is about the position to the under assistance. In Colombia, as I said, there is a counter uprising for a militarism of the state. And of course, that works so that the model operates without trouble. So the government of Gustavo Petro consists of finishing this with a goodwill to reduce so that everyone gives away their, their wealth willingly and abandoning the production and the use of drugs when it is an international problem. And it is determined by the policy of the US, but he won't clash with the US. There were contradictions in there, but it is clear that the sectors still, we need mechanisms of grouping those resistance around the country so they become a more broad project to defend common resources and nature in Colombia. Those who are listening to me know that we have the big disgrace of being one of the most diverse countries in the world because that's not good, because it's not for the benefit of the people, but it is the benefit of the transnational capitalism at a time where resources are running out. When those common resources run out, when those resources run out, imperialism sits every corner of the, of the world for the resources and that affects us. Bueno, gracias, eh, Renan, por tus respuestas. Eh, Very well, Renan, thank you for your responses. Are you there? La primera pregunta es. Which are the issues, the, the programs, meaning uh, the Vespa, the vegan anti capitalist environmental collective? And also, if you could tell us more about what you think of the of Bolsonaro's government regarding the 
the indigenous sectors. What do you think about the measures or the orientation of Bolsonaro's government um, regarding indigenous sectors of the population? Okay, I will start with the first question. I am part of an activist movement. We have uh, four main axes. Veganism, which is uh, a workers and capitalist um, with solidarity. Uh, we, we understand that veganism is more than uh, and eating issue and food issue. Because veganism that does not take into account the environmental issues, the workers issue, turns into uh, only a um, feeding matter. And today we would like to bring to the table that um, how we consume and how the market uh, produces uh, we want to talk about how um, animal products are produced and the damage that the, that production entails. The use of uh, tons of water, natural resources, they demand a great quantity of resources in order to produce less than would be needed to be produced in the same space and with the same resources. So we believe that we have to bring this vision to the table that's more than only feeding or nutrition. And we talk about uh, production, how production um, has a, an environmental impact and how it impacts the working class. Um, and we are anti-capitalist because we understand that within the limits of this capitalist um, model, we cannot produce anything in great scale without a destructive environmental impact. We live in a capitalist system with a capitalist productive model, which exploits the environments for um, profitability, human exploitation huge and, and high rates of human exploitation. And this uh, affects, first of all, the working class before the Wushua sectors. So we want to talk about uh, popular uh, workers, veganism, and how veganism can work and, and pave the way day to day for, for the working class. And regarding Bolsonaro's government uh, and about indigenous sectors, I would say that Brazil for many years has had uh, the wrong policy, an incorrect policy, an orientation, political orientation. We've seen the expansion of agribusiness and the limitation of, of land. Bolsonaro and he facilitated the appropriation, the illegal appropriation of land. He banished the structure of the attorneys that took care of this um, territorial and environmental issue. He destroyed all um, organism of environmental authorities. He was uh, designated uh, military members inside these organisms and organizations in order not to fight against what needed to be fought against. So, also, the rates of deforestation did grow during Bolsonaro's government. And the indigenous sectors are more and more 
uh, imprisoned and with limited spaces. And his administration during COVID um, had a great impact. It hit the population deeply, um, indigenous sectors and working sectors too. Um, it's their um, way to sustain life for these indigenous sectors. He, his measures are against indigenous sectors. The delimitation of land uh, was reduced. There was also a project for indigenous peoples um, to use land. I think that's neoliberalism trying to appropriate um, and own those lands for profitability not actually a measure for indigenous people. And we we analyzed the uh, deforestation in Brazil and it has grown in indigenous sectors. Those lands were gifted, gave, gave, they gave the, those lands away for agribusiness. And those lands are used for the extraction of wood and timber. Bolsonaro's political orientation is the orientation of capitalism. That land needs to be profitable. That land has to be in the hands of those who produce profits and that that would mean progress. But in fact, it does result in an environmental impact uh, which hits the indigenous sectors as well as the communities all along uh, the globe. Thank you, Joao. Jesse, are you there? Yes, I'm here. Well, the first one is, if you could explain a little bit more about the uh, measures of Kitchenerism and the debates in the left with the environmental agenda. And another question is, normally, or usually when we explain the eco-socialist exit and alternative, we talk about agroecology. They talk about that as something impossible. What do you think about that? And there's another question. Uh, an alternative path to extractivism in Argentina, if it has consequences um, regarding solving poverty, since there's 50% of the population in Argentina who live under the line of poverty. It's a rich country with a poor population. Okay, I will try to speak slower this time. First of all, you should know that our organization has been fighting for the coordination of all struggles in all territories at the service of unifying them and, and be able to fight and punch with only one fist and be the stronger. So this happens in the uh, context of an agreement with China in which the plan was to bring uh, hundreds of thousands of pigs for the production of meat. So we launched um, a plurinational organization with different environmental organizations, coordinators, anti-specist organizations, leftist parties, independent people. It's a 
space for struggle, um, to go to direct confrontation and action together against corporations. And those uh, multinational corporations and also political powers. And this um, organization is independent of the states and all of, of the state and all of its institutions. This organization allows us to um, organize with other um, groups and independents, but in a unified uh, way. So there's also a limitation in the environmental um, issue regarding the struggle, because it does help us since it helps us coordinate and unify and fight for the same um, motives together. Since all the environmental organizations have defined themselves as, as working and popular, and some of them has have shown their their true face regarding the government saying that we saying we don't want to be part of this coordinator. In this context in which um, Argentina is badly hit by the extractivist um, advance. Um, we have one example, first of all, which is uh, used uh, for the climate. Um, Eco House is another organization. They talk about regulation, uh, regulating and state controlling uh, the extractivist um, techniques as if we could have some kind of green or human capitalism, nonviolent capitalism. That is the real fantasy. That's uh, what's impossible. Uh, thinking that we can um, control through the state um, this extractivist system and its levels of plundering and pollution. So those currents talking about the regulation of those extractive techniques, for example, uh, offshore exploration, uh, say that we can have a great amount of profits and therefore solve poverty. Those are all lies. In this country, all different governments, those who are servants of international powers, because they gave away they give away anything international corporations need, only leave um, let's say environmental holds. They just gave the um, the soy producers a new uh, dollar value so that they can keep on profiting. And for example, in Paraná, they only had to um, end one of their agreements to open the waterway, but they didn't. So these people come with false ideologies trying to convince us that you can regulate and, or um, control these techniques and activities through the state, even when people and communities repudiate these um, techniques and also organize against them. They have even participated of congresses with the main uh, international corporations which practice uh, mega mining. So they define themselves as popular working organizations, but they, they are not. And they are, uh, they go hand in hand with the government. And there are also organizations which are reformists. They militate and activate for changes inside the systems, they do not uh, try to state that there's a way out of the system to change uh, the structure. So they keep on lobbying and they militate inside uh, legislative um, institutions. But reality is that we do have many laws and, and bills regarding the environment. 
environmental education. We have uh, articles in the national constitutions that also protect the environment, health and life. We do have another agreement, which is international and uh, provides also tools to protect it. But we are going through uh, moments of collapse so huge that a few weeks ago, the communities of Rosario were not able to breathe and the smoke was able to reach uh, the city of Buenos Aires. So there was no way to not see it. Laws are not enough. We are going to keep on fighting for them. It is an essential element, but there is a problem within the elements of this system. The system is the uh, father of all of these um, violent practices and all governments um, just play along with it. And there are also debates in the left. Uh, the Trotskyists left. We are part of the uh, FITU. So uh, not long ago, we did uh, write an article about this because this is a sector that also uh, underestimated the environmental issue. They said that they stated politically that uh, they have like an ideology that if the great personalities of socialism did not elaborate any on anything on that. So then there's no need to, to work on that. And they believe that if the working sectors were in charge of those techniques, then it wouldn't be a damaging with, for example, mega mining. So extractive, um, activity as any productive activity should be controlled by the workers and in a socialist society, then it would be fair to, to practice them. So th there's no debate about if they're progressive or not. And that's a big mistake to support the communities that are struggling. Uh, that is a great political mistake. So if 15 years ago, you told me uh, when we were uh, we had Carrasco and we didn't have health reports, then I would understand that right now, even bourgeois um, institutions and the scientific community who have decided to act um, state that agrotoxics uh, kill and poison allergies, they uh, pollute the air, There's, uh, they say that it kills, it actually kills. So the rep revolutionary left in this context cannot state that it should be regulated or controlled by workers. It has to be prohibited. That is the logic of uh, capital accumulation and that um, it depends on which class controls it, uh, that, that the nature of the activity depends on which class uh, controls it, and it is not like that. On the contrary, we are making our own contribution to fight against this system. We reject that leftist productivist um, stand and orientation. We have just talked about uh, the environmental disasters that were carried out during um, the bureaucratized uh, worker states. Uh, next week, we are going to um, carry out a um, coordination and encounter of fumigated uh, communities. And we are waiting for a PO to be able to talk about um, agrotoxic regulations in front of those communities. as if uh, using agrotoxins uh, a few hundred miles away from the communities was a solution. Those of us who consider ourselves revolutionaries, uh, we have a program, uh, an ideological program to fight against extractivism. 
with a democratic orientation. We have to be clear. We want communities and workers to decide absolutely everything, not those who have always chosen for us. And for those that it is a little bit complex today for someone, well, in, in the middle of um, a war in Ukraine, and as we have seen the resistance of the Ukrainian people against Russian imperialism, and in which anything could happen, even a third uh, world war, in which uh, conflicts, armed conflicts could uh, deepen. There are wars in the 21st century, pandemics, collapse in the environmental, the most important environmental crisis in history, the destruction of forests, of the Amazon region. We are talking about ecosystems that enable life in this planet. So be careful because we are not the ones who are stating impossible scenarios. Those who are um, stating impossible scenarios are those who call us to trust this system. We have to be on the sides of the communities who fight against those who have brought us to this collapse. So if you could produce healthy uh, products, healthy crops with agroecology, in which when one hectare you could uh, feed one, uh, um, 15 families, when we're using millions of them only uh, for crops to feed um, to feed pigs, for example, using poison in the meantime. We could even uh, create a solidary um, market to feed the five continents. So today, democracy is being discussed, having a full job is being discussed. My parents uh, dreamed of having a house of their own. Today, our dream is just having a stable job. So which, one, which of us is utopian? They are the ones who state impossible situations and who say that extractivism is development and also progress. There have been social uprisings everywhere, United States, Colombia, Peru, Chile, Sri Lanka. There is no continent that has not fought against political regimes in this context in which they keep on trying to make more profits in in the meantime, they keep on producing new um, social uprisings, and we have to keep on uh, supporting them everywhere to be able to kick them out of power, kick those um, who try to keep on making profits with us paying the price, uh, kick them out. So it is essential to make these uh, international encounters and meetings and to um, exchange information. And I will slow down now. Uh, these international forums and seminars so we can deepen uh, the struggle experiences to create a strong and socialist and anti-capitalist and revolutionary and internationalist organizations so that we can develop those um, social uprisings and keep on pushing those masses for a world that we can actually live in and the world that we deserve. I think that is realistic. Uh, instead of falling into skepticism and thinking that nothing can be done, we cannot resign. We cannot keep on thinking that it is not possible to change this. We need 
to believe that organization, it is is necessary to change uh, this world. We can save at least a little bit of the future of humanity. It is really worth the price. So I, I forgot about the questions. Mariana, if you could please repeat the last one. We are running out of time. Okay, then that's all. Okay, now Joao, Renan, do you want to add anything else briefly? Joao? Are you there? Uh, my computer is not um, working as it should. Would you please repeat the last um, thing you said? If you would like to add anything briefly. Yes, yes, I would. Um, I think that this debate, this environmental debate needs to be an eco-socialist debate. We are living in a context in which capitalism tries to renew itself um, as a product that can actually solve our issues. So I think that one of our main conclusions and one of the things that we need to see uh, regarding environmental impact is that if we do not socialize, socialize the productive forces and in understand that the, the environment is, uh, that we need the environment to live in this planet, uh, this uh, there is no planet B thing, the only real solution is eco-socialism. So if we don't talk about eco-socialism, if we don't understand the, the productive uh, forces and extractivism and productivism, we are not going to be able to reach the end of this generation. The environmental impact is huge. We need a um, solution right now. The gathering of uh, revolutionaries is necessary. If we don't talk about eco-socialism, we are going to see the working class defeated with all of these um, plans of capitalism to renew itself. They need to defeat us to do so. Okay, so listening to these um, interesting expositions uh, of our comrades, I would just like to say that I can take Walter Benjamin's statement from 1940, in which he said that the revolution is the emergency break for to avoid humanity to um, crash driven by capitalism. I think that's something that we need to repeat more than ever. We have to fight against global warming. That is an issue of a global dimension as never before. And it is what the logic of capital accumulation has taken us. So we have to fight against that logic. And there are um, sectors we need to, to speak to about that. Farmers, poor people, workers, because um, they are the first affected by these consequences. So it's like a double struggle. It is social and it's also environmental. You cannot uh, take them apart uh, as some historical lefts have done so. 
even boosting and encouraging um, environmental reading courses and literacy seminars. And at the time of the Russian Revolution, there was no, uh, I think there was no understanding of the destruction of the planet and its dimension um, due to capitalist uh, productive models. But we can discuss that, or we can also discuss how to avoid capitalism um, destroying the only planet that we've known, and with that planet, all of us. Thank you so much, Renan. Okay, so this is the end of the third panel.